So this is an approach to the diagnosis of anemia, and it's something that has stood my stead for many years. Historically, Susurata actually described Pandu Roga, and he thought it was a type of jaundice. Charaka actually described Pika, that's 200 BC. And it was in China that the doctrine that anemia can cause a weak pulse was first enunciated. Now, clinically, there are two approaches to anemia. One is the clinical approach, and the other is the laboratory approach. I'd start with the laboratory approach, which is basically based on red cell size. If you have small red cells, it's microcytic. If you have large red cells, it's macrocytic. And if the red cell size is not disturbed, it's normocytic. Now, the two main causes of a microcytic anemia are iron deficiency and thalassemia. The rest of the causes, like lead poisoning, chronic inflammation, cerebroblastic anemia, are not common. The main cause of a macrocytic anemia is B12 and folate. Liver disease and mixed edema can also cause a large red cell. Normocytic, the main condition you need to think of is blood loss, but it can also occur in renal failure and in red cell enzyme defects. So essentially, the approach is based on red cell size. And today, with the advent of the Kuta counter and the availability of an accurate mean corpuscular volume, you can see here, this really helps you because <clears throat> the electronic cell counters not only give you a mean corpuscular volume, they also give you a normogram of the size of the red cell. This is going to be covered subsequently by a talk on interpretation of hemogram. So I'm not going to go into this. As I told you, the major causes of anemia with a low MCV are iron deficiency and thalassemia. How do you distinguish the two? If you have the indices, then you look at the red cell distribution width. If you have got a lot of anisocytosis, which means the RDW is more than 19, then you're dealing with iron deficiency. Medical students often ask me why. I think it's because in different parts of the marrow, the amount of iron available may be different. And therefore, the red cell size is different and you have an isocytosis. The second major cause is thalassemia. Because it's a generic defect, all the cells are the same size and therefore the red cell distribution width is low. And this refers to mainly thalassemia minor because thal major is quite easy to diagnose. This is the peripheral blood smear of a patient with iron deficiency. You can see how hypochromic and microcytic the red blood cells are. You find pencil cells and an occasional teardrop cell. This is a classic severe iron deficiency anemia. Now, the second is anemia with a high MCV, right? Now, the mean corpuscular volume can be falsely elevated in an autoimmune hemolytic anemia because red cells are clumping as they cross the laser, and therefore you get a false high MCV. So, suppose your printout says the MCV is 140. Chances are you're dealing with an autoimmune hemolytic anemia and not a B12 folate deficiency. You'll never get a 140 MCV in a person with B12 folate deficiency. The true microcytic anemias can be due to alcoholism, B12 and folate deficiency, hypothyroidism, and myelodysplastic syndromes. In an elderly person with an MCV of 100, 104, you must keep in mind a myelodysplastic syndrome. This is the peripheral smear in a megaloblastic anemia, and you can see the beautiful hyper-segmented neutrophil. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-
six, seven, eight lobes, right? So this used to be called the Arneth count, and this is a megaloblastic anemia. Somehow in B12 and folate deficiency, the megaloblasts are oval in size, oval in shape, right? So this is a classic megaloblastic anemia. Now the second approach is the clinical approach. Now this approach is what I prefer, where you ask the question, is this anemia due to a production problem or is it due to a loss problem, right? That's the fundamental question you ask. Any cytopenia in the blood can only be due to two reasons, decreased production, increased loss. Now, when you look at decreased production, right? I'll come to that in a minute. Now, how can you lose blood? There are only two ways you can lose, lose red blood cells. One is by bleeding and two is by hemolysis. So actually anemia is very simple, okay? So only two ways you can lose blood, hemorrhage or hemolysis. And the hemorrhage can be from any of the sites listed here, mainly the GI tract. The kidney is very obvious. Uterus you mustn't forget because of menorrhagia and other causes which I'll come to later. Right? Now, hemolysis is the second condition where you lose blood and I'll come to that in a minute. So I like this cartoon. This is tomatoes in the shop. This is the field where there's good production of tomatoes and there is a normal consumption. So there is a level of tomato in the shop, which is appreciable. Now here, the field has been damaged by pest or no rain or whatever. So there is no production, no tomatoes in the shop. Consumption remains the same. And here you have no tomatoes in the shop, but there's absolutely no problem with the production. It's just that it's festival time and people have been buying all the tomatoes. So simple algorithm. Is it a production problem? Is it a loss problem? Now, what is the single test that can help answer this question? It is the reticulocyte count. Now, if the reticulocyte count is raised 12%, there's absolutely no sense in doing a bone marrow because the bone marrow is producing red blood cells. So why do you want to do a bone marrow? So the reticulocyte count is the key to answer the question whether it is a production problem or a loss problem, right? Now, nowadays with the counters, you will get an absolute reticulocyte count. So a 5 million red cell count with a 1% reticulocyte translates to 50,000 absolute reticulocyte count. Similarly, with the 1 million red cell count and a 1% reticulocyte, which is the same, the absolute reticulocyte count is 10,000. So you must have this concept in your mind of the absolute count. This applies to red cells, to platelets, to white cells. Now in white cell, for instance, we like to talk about the absolute neutrophil count, right? Because that's what guides our severity of neutrophil. Now another way is to correct the reticulocyte count. You take what value you've got, Multiply it by, by the observed hemoglobin E divided by the expected hemoglobin. So a 4% retic with a HB of 3 gets corrected 4 into 3 by 12, which is 1%, which means that for a 3 gram hemoglobin, a 1% retic is low, and it means that the bone marrow is not responding appropriately to the anemia. Now this cartoon explains everything. So a person with anemia, is it decreased production, increased loss? If it's increased loss, is it hemorrhage or is it hemolysis? If it's hemolysis, there are only two causes, congenital or acquired. And I'll come to that in a minute. If it's a production problem, 
then you ask yourself, is it only red cells or is it all three cell lines? So if the white cell count and the platelet count are down along with the red cell, then it's pan cytopenia. If only the red cell count is low and the retic is low, then it has to be a bone marrow problem. If it's a bone marrow problem and you do a bone marrow and you find that there are no erythroid precursors in the bone marrow, right? Now, if that happens, then you are saying this is a pure red cell aplasia. So no erythroids in the bone marrow. This is a pure red cell aplasia, which can be congenital, which is a black Van Diamen syndrome, or acquired pure red cell aplasia. Now, suppose you have anemia with a low retic count, and the bone marrow is full of erythroid cells. That means these erythroid cells are not maturing are not producing red blood cells. So the condition you think of is a myelodysplastic syndrome or a congenital dyserythropoietic anemia, right? This covers all you ever need to know about anemia. Patient has a low hemoglobin, ask yourself, is it decreased production, increased loss? If it's increased loss, only two causes, hemorrhage or hemolysis. If it's hemolysis, it is either congenital or acquired. If you have decreased production, reticulocyte count low, all three cell lines, pancytopenia. Only red cells go to the bone marrow. No erythroids in the marrow. <coughs> Diagnosis, pure red cell aplasia. Erythroid cells, plenty in the bone marrow, yet the patient is anemic. These cells are not maturing. So you're most probably dealing with a myelodysplastic syndrome or a congenital dyserythropoietic anemia, right? So suppose you have all three cell lines down. If it's only red cells, I've told you what to do, right? No red cells, black Van Diamen or PRCA. Erythroid hyperplasia, then it's either a CDA or sideroblastic anemia or a myelodysplastic syndrome. Now, if you have pancytopenia, again, is it a decreased production or increased loss? If it's decreased production, these are the only causes. One, bone marrow is empty, aplastic anemia. Two, the bone marrow has been replaced by something that shouldn't be there. Leukemia, lymphoma, secondary tumor, fibrous tissue, granuloma. Any of these things replacing the marrow and you have pancytopenia. Next, the bone marrow is full of cells, but they're not working. Myelodysplastic syndrome. Next, bone marrow again, chock a block full of cells, but there's pancytopenia, megaloblastic anemia. And two rare causes of a pancytopenia is peripheral destruction due to hypersplenism, or rarely an autoimmune pancytopenia in SLE. So this is how you approach a pancytopenia. So a few words about evaluating a hemolytic anemia. When you suspect hemolysis, as I said, it can be congenital or acquired. In a congenital hemolytic anemia, the bone marrow has been expanding. So you get skeletal abnormalities, frontal bossing, maxillary prominence, Harrison sulcus, genu valgum, right? you will have jaundice, right? And the jaundice is associated with colorless urine. Despite what the books tell you, right? It is actually a choleric urine. There can be hepatosplenomegaly and that there can be chronic leg ulcers. So you see a six-year-old child, he's got prominent bossing, he's got jaundice, your diagnosis you find that the spleen is enlarged, the diagnosis is a congenital hemolytic anemia. Few words about bilirubin. Normally, when red cells are destroyed in the spleen, you get the production of bilirubin, which comes to the liver, gets conjugated, is excreted in the bile, and 
comes into the intestine where it's called stercobilinogen or urobilinogen. This is absorbed by the kidney and is excreted in the urine. Now, urobilinogen is a colorless compound. Once the urine is passed, the urobilinogen gets oxidized to urobilin, and that gives you a tea colored urine. Right? So, please remember that the urine, when passed in a hemolytic anemia, is colorless. After passing on standing, it will become colored like Coca-Cola, right? So indicators that you're dealing with the hemolytic anemia. First, a raised reticulocyte count. This is the most important. If you don't have a retic count and you have polychromasia on the film, that means that the retics are raised. Second, raised serum bilirubin. And here it will be the indirect reacting bilirubin, which is raised. Next, increase in urinary urobilinogen. We almost never do this test today. It's too cumbersome. And this, I believe, is very, very important. Raised LDH. If your LDH is normal, it is unlikely that there is significant hemolysis. Right? Now, there are some features on the laboratory testing which are characteristic of intravascular hemolysis. That means the red cells are being broken down inside the bloodstream. One is the presence of hemoglobin in the urine, right? How do you distinguish hematuria from hemoglobinuria? You can just let the urine stand. If it stands and it's hematuria, the red cells come to the bottom and the urine is clear. If it's hemoglobinuria, it will remain wine colored even on standing. Next is plasma hemoglobin. Next is a decreased haptoglobin. I would like to tell the residents that this is too sensitive a test. It's not worth doing. When you have sepsis, the haptoglobin will be decreased. So it's a waste of money to do a haptoglobin. It is too sensitive a test of intravascular hemolysis. And rarely you can get something called methemalgin. So these are the laboratory indicators of hemolysis. Raised retic, raised indirect bilirubin, raised LDH, and intravascular hemolysis, presence of human hemoglobin, plasma hemoglobin. These are the indicators of hemolysis. Now coming to the causes, what are the causes? This also is very simple. Actually, hematology is a very simple discipline, right? There are only two causes, congenital and acquired. Among the congenital causes, there are only three. One is a problem with the red cell membrane. Two is a problem with hemoglobin, which can be either qualitative or quantitative. And three is a red cell enzyme problem, right? Red cell membrane, spherocytosis. Qualitative hemoglobin problem, sickle cell disease. Quantitative hemoglobin problem, thalassemia. One thing I want to tell you is that in a person with thalassemia major, there is no jaundice. Why is there no jaundice? because the total hemoglobin produced is reduced in thalassemia. So there cannot be jaundice in thalassemia major. Can be there in Ibira thalassemia because that is a combination of a hemoglobinopathy and a thalassemia, right? Next is red cell enzyme deficiency, T6PD and PK, and many more. So, only three congenital causes of hemolytic anemia. Red cell membrane, hemoglobin, red cell enzyme. What are the acquired causes of hemolytic anemia? One is antibody mediated. And that is the Coombs test will tell you. If the Coombs is positive, then you're dealing with an acquired hemolytic anemia, which is antibody mediated. If the Coombs is negative, 
then the other condition which you must keep in your mind is paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria right most of the other acquired causes are apparent because of the condition in which they occur right acid poisoning heat stroke infections like malaria mycoplasma osmotic as after a prostatectomy if they've used distilled water instead of saline to do the transurethral prostatectomy microangiopathy where the red cells are cut like in ttp hus or dic traumatic where you have a valve copper sulfate poisoning common agricultural poisoning and rarely a disease which we don't see nowadays because there's no syphilis is paroxysmal cold hemoglobinuria right so this tells you the congenital causes and how you approach do a blood picture you do a sickle prep electrophoresis you do osmotic fragility check for unstable hemoglobin and a hines body and do a red cell enzyme that more or less covers evaluation of congenital hemolytic anemia and acquired if the cause is not obvious then you need to do a coombs test and test for ph few blood pictures diagnosis thalassemia major why nucleated red blood cells target cells hypochromic microcytosis diagnosis pal major diagnosis sickle cell anemia diagnosis red cell full of hemoglobin central pallor is lost over here right this is a spherocytosis here you see the red cells clumped this is an autoimmune hemolytic anemia what do you see here you see something called a schistocyte a cell which has been cut in half right you see lots of fragmented cells you see microspherocyte and this is the picture that you will see in a hus or a ttp or a dic right this is what i meant by polychromasia where you have larger red cells which are bluish in color because they are reticulocytes they haven't lost their rna as yet so this is about investigating a patient with thalassemia or a hemoglobinopathy these are the tests that you can do a sickle prep a solubility test very quickly you can diagnose sickle you can do an electrophoresis today we hardly ever do electrophoresis we end up doing a hplc this is the variant it's an automated system and you can see here this is a person where all of the hemoglobin is fetal hemoglobin so this particular person is a thalassemia major right here you can see the raised a2 which is 5. Point, which is 4.3% here and this is the hallmark of thalassemia minor and you can confirm by electrophoresis right so investigating a case which is not thalassemia look at the peripheral smear check osmotic fragility do a hines body do a heat test for unstable hemoglobin and estimate g6p 90% of the congenital hemolytic anemias will be covered by these tests now suppose at the end of every test you still don't have a diagnosis then we call it a congenital non spherocytic hemolytic anemia and that may indicate that this patient has a red cell enzyme deficiency other than g6pd or pk so investigating a patient with an acquired hemolytic anemia i have already told you doing a coombs test please remember that if your patient is direct coombs test negative and indirect coombs test positive this indicates an allo antibody and not an auto anti so there's an antibody in the patient's serum but it's not present on his red cells therefore an ict positivity indicates previous immunization 
by pregnancy or transfusion, and it is not indicative of an autoimmune hemolytic anemia. Right? These are the tests which we do for PNH. They're old tests. Today, we almost always straight away go to a flow cytometry. But I believe this test is very useful, a urine hemosiderin, which will tell you, yes, there is intravascular hemolysis, which is chronic, right? So all you need to approach an anemia correctly is a CBC. And in the CBC, look at the reticulocyte count, look at the MCV, right? Look at the peripheral smear, bone marrow aspirates and biopsy. And with this instrument alone, you can make a correct diagnosis in most patients with anemia. So it is seldom that an anemia is refractory. It is more often the physician who is refractory rather than the anemia if you approach it correctly. <clears throat> Sandeep, uh, I've got two, three more slides. Yeah. Anemia in infancy and childhood. If a new need has anemia, then these are the differentials. Is it blood loss? Is it isoimmunization? That means the baby is A positive and mom is O positive and she's produced an antibody against the baby. Is it a congenital infection? Is it a congenital hemolytic anemia? Most congenital hemolytic anemias manifest only after two to three months and not at birth. Very, very rarely a pure red cell aplasia can manifest in the neonate. So these are the causes of anemia in the neonate, right? Now, suppose you've got a four month old baby with anemia. The most important diagnosis would be thalassemia major red cell aphasia, or a congenital dyserythropoietic anemia. These are the three differential diagnoses in a three, four month old baby, apart from iron deficiency, which generally manifests a little later because the baby is a parasite and has taken enough iron from the mother to last the baby for six months at least, right? The problem comes when you have a six-month-old baby who's received transfusion. Same differential diagnosis, thalassemia major, PRCA, or a congenital dyserythropoietic anemia. The problem is that the fetal hemoglobin level may be low after transfusion and will go down the wrong pathway. Even if you wait, sometimes the fetal hemoglobin level doesn't come up, and therefore you will have to resort molecular tests or check whether both parents are carriers, right? If you do that and both parents are carriers and the child had a HB of three or four and was transfused when the child came to you, chances are that you're dealing with major and you need to do a confirmation by DNA diagnostics, right? Congenital dyserythropoietic anemias are not common, but as I said, you will have a person with anemia a low rating, a parasplenomegaly, and a bone marrow which is full of developing erythroid cells, right? I'll skip the slide, pregnancy and anemia, I'll leave that. So in evaluating an anemia, take a good history, do a thorough physical exam, ask the right questions, do the appropriate laboratory tests, and you will not go wrong. Thank you very much.